Sir Mike Ken has been changed. Uh, the spirit moves expressively at times. We thank God for that here. And the sermonic hymn comes in your hymnal number 425. Number 425 in your hymnals. It's been a change. Uh, please go with me to number 425 in your hymnal. So when you have it, could we just stand as we honor God and worship His holy name? Thank you. We got ahead of ourselves. Yeah. But it's good, it's all good. It's all good. It's all good. Don't worry. Please bear with us. Please bear with us. Uh, please turn in your Bibles. We can't forget the Word of God. Amen. Please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Hold that page in your hymnals. I know you guys can multitask. So praise the Lord. And turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Amen. I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 14 down to 31. And when you have it, I know a lot of you are already standing. When you have it, let's all stand. Amen. You are able. Praise the Lord. And it begins at the 14th verse. Amen. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not the body of the body. It is therefore not of the body. And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body. It is therefore not of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? Was the hearing, excuse me. If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now have God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more of those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempted the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. That, were, that there should be no schism, schism excuse me, in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God has set some in the church first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teaches, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Amen. May God bless the reading, the hearing, and the doing of his holy word. Hallelujah. Now, now, saints, hallelujah. Please turn with me in your hymnals 
the number 425, let me mark that space, and then you're all on one accord, amen? Number 425 in our hymn. function as one because Lord you're in the midst to unite and to bless us bless your words to our hearts now let your words come into our hearts and dwell there and give us a week of blessing as we go forth from this place rejoicing when you have done such a great job in us hear us now we pray in Jesus name amen and amen you may be seated. Please turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This is one of the tough writings of Paul. We're going to read it today. I'll be reading verses 1 through 9. And he begins. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as to carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and division, are you not carnal and walking as men? For while one said, I am of Paul and another, I am of Apollos. Are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed 
even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that planted anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building, according to the grace of God which is given unto me. I'm reading verse 10. As a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. May God add his blessings reading of his word you know people like to be soft treated softly in church and I said last week that if Paul was ministering now a lot of pastors would be fired because they are not preaching the word of God they are in the pulpit finding another way around the word of God. Paul is brutal here with the Corinthian church in the first part of this passage. He's saying to them, you are a divided people because you are carnal. Because you are carnal. Carnality is in your congregation. Sarkikos. It means that the flesh, the flesh is in strong opposition to the spirit. And then instead of listening to the spirit, we are giving way to the flesh. So they are carnal. They are giving place to the temporary instead of the eternal. They are unregenerate. They are acting as if they are unsaved. Letting the nature of the flesh win over the nature of the spirit. So he's not taking it easy on them. We read it and we, we go over it as if he's not talking to us. He calls them spiritual babies. You go out there and some little guy look at you and say, Girl, boy, you get mad. You feel disrespected. But here's Paul saying, the church is behaving as if they are babies. I'm telling you today that what I come to talk about today is to let you know we are better together. Amen? We are better together. They were a divided church. They were unable to work together, the Corinthian church. Verse 3 says, the reason they couldn't do it is because they were still fleshly. For since there is envy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not living like ordinary people? And the verses show the source of their division. Some people were attached to them, attaching themselves to Paul and others to Apollos. 
They had rivalries. Paul had founded the church. Apollos was left there to minister to the church. But all of a sudden, there was a division among the two pastors of the church. There was some playing politics. And that caused the division. But we are one. We don't all have the same gifts. Apollos was a handsome young man. Paul was not so handsome. <laughs> Apollos' delivery of the message was a little more tempered than the way Paul preached. He was good looking and mild. Paul was authoritative. He was the apostle. He was the founder. He was the father of the church. And he felt he never had to be too careful. Because God gave him the authority to preach to the church. So all of a sudden, I prefer when Apollos preach, you know. Because he's not too rough on us. You know? <laughs> but Paul, when he comes, man, he is tearing down walls and fences and he's building new structures and he's reprimanding and commanding. So they couldn't see beyond themselves and see the spirituality in what was being preached. Paul says, let me tell you something. I fed you with milk and not with meat. Up to now, I've been treating you the way you are. You are babies. And since you are babies, babies get milk. Okay? We don't give babies meat because they will choke up on it. So we, I'm giving you milk. You're not able to bear to chew meat yet. I used to have a guy who drove me around in Jamaica whenever I'm going out to preach. And he loved to drive me. And he said, I said, Brother Wilfred, are you going to take me Sunday? I'm going to St. Elizabeth to preach. Or I'm going this place to preach or that place. He says, Pastor, you know I'm coming with you. Because I can't stand to get the cream off the cake. I like to get some of the cake too. Because they treat you like baby. They, they just take off some of the icing and give it to you like you're a baby. And say, come little baby, eat some of this. But I want some of the cake. Oh yeah. Thanks for it. <laughs> <laughs> so he says so Paul is saying I'm giving you some meat and it's time you can chew meat now you're growing up you should be growing up hallelujah and because of the carnality and because of the fleshliness there was division in the church in the church God wants us to work together as one body. Everybody can't be the eye. Everybody can't be the hand. Everybody can't be the feet. Everybody can't be the air. Somebody have to, they, you must assume the function you have in the church. Somebody has the gift of giving. Somebody has the gift of doing. Somebody has an empathetic gift. Somebody has the gift. Everybody has a different gift. And we bring all those gifts together without murmuring and complaining. We just do what we ought to do. 
And all of a sudden, the church started to function as a well-oiled machine. And everybody is doing their own work. And everything comes together. The Independent Commission investigating September 11, 2001, the terrorist attack reported that the rescue efforts were hampered by rivalry between the police and the fire department. And a lot of problems could have been averted if these two had come together. And all the witnesses there witnessed to that 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 division caused problems. Right now there are big problems in this country. Why? Because there is rivalry, political rivalry, and the people of this country are paying dearly. Americans needed and they need now to cooperate, not compete. On that day, they needed to cooperate, not compete. They needed to set aside their own private ambitions. Everybody wants to be a hero. Their own hero. Get their own plaque. And that's the same thing in church today. Everybody wants to claim, I was the one who did that. And I was the one who did that. And if it weren't for me, instead of saying, we all came together like a good potluck Sunday. Somebody can cook macaroni and cheese. Somebody does good fried chicken. Another person does good curry gold. And we have a wonderful combination of meals. And we might even end up with a balanced diet. But if everybody brings fried chicken, we're going to have a problem. Amen? So when you come to church, you have to bring your gifts. Bring your gifts. Bring your own gift. Bring your gift. Come together. Let us put it together. Somebody sings alto. Some sing soprano. Some sings bass. Some are baritones. Some are tenors. And when all of that come together, you know, I'm from Jamaica where sometimes we don't have no musician in church. But when you hear that tenor and that bass and that soprano and all these people come together, you would never think that a cappella music is ringing out and there is such a great harmony. Because they know that unity is not unison. Amen? You have to bring all the different things together to create harmony. We are better together. Say it after me. We are better together. We are stronger together. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians and he wrote earlier in the book, Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and there be no divisions among you, but you may complete in the same mind, in the same judgment. When we have the same goal, let me tell you something. When we are working toward the same goal, and we are doing it together as the body of Christ. We can achieve anything. That's why God stopped the 
power of Babel. You know why he confused them? He said, these people are united. And if they be united, if they come together like that, they can achieve whatever they set out to achieve. I have to stop them now. <laughs> that's why he, 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 that's what stopped the Tower of Babel. God confused them and disunited them in order to stop it. And guess what God do, did for the New Testament church? He brought all those languages back together on the day of Pentecost up in the upper room and he bring you back together now. You're not a confused people anymore, but you're going to ex achieve exploits for the kingdom of God. Yeah. And when Peter came down and started to preach, there was no confusion because the Greek understand him, the Hebrew understand him, the Amar Aramaic heard him in his own language. All the people of the world heard Peter without an interpreter standing there. Only the Holy Spirit interpreting. They say, how come we hear him in our own language? God brought it back together. He divided it on the day he messed up the Tower of Babel. But we're not babbling anymore. Hallelujah! He gives us a clear message. He gave Peter a clear message on the day of Pentecost. Praise the Lord. God united the language. He brought them back together. So now he says they are neither Greek nor Jew. Nor Gentile. Nor male nor female. We are one in Christ Jesus. We are one in Christ Jesus. You don't have to be exceptional. <coughs> None of us has to be exceptional. All we have to do is seek to glorify God. And bring what we have to the altar. I'm so glad that the Corinthian church had this problem. Because it allows us to have this beautiful teaching that Paul gave. Paul makes clear that Apollos, that he and Apollos were partners, not competitors in ministry. Let me tell you something. I've been in church and I've heard pastors quarreling in the pulpit. Believe me, quarreling with each other in the pulpit. I preached at a place and a woman preached after me and she came up after me in her preaching. And I'm like, aren't we serving the same God? Aren't we preaching the same gospel? And she started to rail. And I was like, whoa, what kind of spirit is this? Carnal. Carnal. I wasn't seeking to get church members for Global. I was only a guest speaker. <coughs> They're just doing their part. The kingdom of God is not a kingdom of division. When the disciples came to Jesus and said, we went down the road and we saw some guys casting out demons. Yeah. And should we go back and stop them? Jesus said, leave them alone. Yeah. If they are not with us, they are against us. And every kingdom divided against itself must fall. At the end of the day, it's God who gives the growth. It's not what you want or what I want. If we want growth, we will get it. If we don't want growth, we can keep on bickering and showing who has the power and who doesn't. But Paul says sometimes the, the weaker 
member of the body get more attention, doesn't it? Huh? The foot that hurt, doesn't it get the most attention? <laughs> it gets the most attention. The hand that hurt gets the most attention. The eye that hurts gets the most attention. Sometimes it's the weaker limb that gets the most attention. So it's God who gives the increase. We are only laborers in God's vineyards. But it's God who gives the increase. Paul says, I plant, Apollos maintained, he watered, but God gave the increase. It is God who gives the increase. It is God who deserves the glory. For we are God's co-workers. It doesn't mean we are equal to God. Because he explained that he says we are God's building so let's just examine first three phrases Paul uses here we are God's co-workers co does not always mean equality you bear that in mind on your job and everywhere else Co does not always mean equality. Because God says we are his co-workers, it does not mean we are equal with God. It means that God uses us and he helps us to participate in what he is doing in the kingdom. Sometimes you, you have a co-owner but is not equal with you. That person only has 1% or 2% of the business interest. They're not equal with you. But you were smart enough to do it because it helps the business to grow. That's what business people do from time to time. They give a person percent or three percent because they know that motivates the person doesn't mean they're equal with the owner it's the same thing with God God helps us and wants us to participate in the kingdom work and so he gives us the great commission Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have taught you. And I will be with you always to the end of the age. <coughs> so that's our duty as a church. The, the Great Commission is our unifying mission. It is God's agenda, not ours. And we work together to achieve a common goal. Bring others into the fold of God. That's what it means to be co-workers. We have the same objective and we are working together to achieve that objective. If you have someone in a hole and all of us go out there looking down there we have to come together with our minds and we have to say, how can we get that person 
out of the hole. So we have, we have a common objective. We're going to rescue that person. But we have to do it with unity of mind and heart so that instead of hurting the person, we are saving the person. None of us want the individual praise. So we're going to brainstorm. And we're going to say, how, how can we make this work? Someone is going to say, you've got to get a rope. Another a ladder. Somebody is going to say all different things. Maybe we'll form a chain. What are we going to do? And then we'll come together and we will use our deductive reasoning and we will come and we will unite our heart around one way, one method. And that method is going to work because we agree upon it. So we all leave there high-fiving one another. Not just one person. <laughs> we are high-fiving one another because we all did it together. We all did it together. All those people who are in church today, we must remember that people who normally won't work together can do it if they have a common goal. Hallelujah. We can do it if we have a common goal. That's what is missing in the church today. That was what was missing in the Corinthian church. People placed importance on certain gifts more than other gifts. And Paul had to come together and say, let's bring all these gifts together and we will have a stronger body. There's always a leader. There's always someone who is in charge. But it does not mean that that person must do all the work. It means that we come together and we call and we say, how are we going to do this? Not how are you going to do this, but how are we going to do this? How are we going to achieve this? How will we reach there together? How will we get there together? Amen. I'm proud of Global Evangelist Ministries. From time to time, we don't always agree. I always tell people who I counsel to get married, if you all agree upon the same thing, upon everything, one of you is not too smart. <laughs> We don't always agree, but at the end of the day, we get it together. You are generous and you are kind. You shake your head sometimes and say, again? But you still do it. Because you're doing it to the glory of God. You're doing it to the glory of God. Sister Morris would always say, we can't just, we have to do it decent and in order. We have to look good together as a church. Let us do it to the glory of God. We all want the same desired outcome. We should want that as a church. If you're not pulling together with that, you have a problem. We should all want the same desired outcome. Ex 
excellency's standard with me. That can be overbearing. It feels difficult sometimes. And it's hard when I see that we're not doing our best. Because I know we can do better. But when somebody else wants defeat and one wants victory, when somebody else, we're running in this race together and we're together in this race and we want the same thing. We might not all get to the finishing, the finishing rope, but we are going to enable other members of the team to run who can get there. Amen? We're going to help the team because if one wins, the team wins. And the person who reached here first doesn't have to be me. Because we are all together in this. We are co-workers. Because Jesus is working beside us. He says, I will be with you to the end of the age. Jesus didn't give us the great commission and go and sit down beside the pool and sip some cold glass of iced tea and say, let them do the work. I've already gone to the cross. I've died up there already. Look what I have gone through. He didn't have to go with us anymore. He did his finished work and he said the work is finished. And he, Jesus is like a workaholic. He says, I'm sending you, you know, but I'm coming with you. I'm sending you, but I'm coming with you. I'm coming with you. Hallelujah. I'm coming with you. <laughs> I'm coming with you. I'm sending you, but I'm coming with you. Promise to be with us as we do his work. He's in the trenches with us. He's fighting with us. Why? Because he wants us to conquer. We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. Actually, I personally find that I get closer to him when I'm at work with him. I get closer to him when I'm busy doing his work. When I'm busy doing his work, there's no time for idle chatter. There's no time for gossip. There's no time to be out there doing anything else. Because I have to be busy focusing on God's work and praying. Trying to accomplish what he has called me because that is more important than anything I want for me. If you want to be near to God, then you have to go out into the field and work because that's where Jesus is. Jesus is not in a lazy bed or an easy chair. Jesus is busy. First John chapter 1 verse 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we walk in the light, not only do we draw near to God, but also we draw closer together. That's what fellowship means, my friend. Let me tell you something. In heaven, you won't have no reserve seats. Amen? You're going to have to mingle together. You're going to have no classes in either, no separation by class or by education or money. You're going to have to all 
live together. This is rehearsal. This is rehearsal. This is rehearsal. This is the body of Christ. This is work must bring us closer together because we have much to do and to accomplish. There's a song, I listened to it last night because as I search for illustrations, I, I, I have I come upon some great ones. Some of them are too long, so I don't bother with them. But there's a song by Jack Johnson. He wrote his love song to his wife. He was thinking of his wife when he wrote this song. And he says, I think the words apply also to Christian fellowship today. It's not always easy and sometimes life can be deceiving. But I'll tell you one thing. It's always better when we're together. <laughs> it's always better when we're together. Amen. not always easy and sometimes life can be deceiving but I know one thing it's always better when we're together true fellowship rarely happens over a cup of coffee or a plate of spaghetti or ackee and codfish or whatever your favorite dish is real fellowship happens beside a hospital bed or over a paint can or in a committee meeting real fellowship happens because these are the places where we agree we agree we come to an agreement that's real fellowship we come to agree. Jesus himself says that's what ties everything together. If two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst to bless and to do good. If two of you shall agree upon anything concerning anything, I will hear and I will answer your prayer. God wants us to agree. We develop stronger relationships working together for the cause of Christ than we will ever achieve in small chatter or gossip or anything else. Beside the added benefit of building strong relationships, working together increases the possibility or the probability of the successful completion of a mission. <coughs> Tom Westman credits two things with his million dollar victory of Survivor Palau. First being himself and second applying two things he learned as a firefighter. Survival and teamwork. There is no I in the word team. No I in the word T. Dr. Paula Rooney, president of Dean College in Franklin, Massachusetts, told one of her graduating class, you cannot undertake life as a spectator sport. True success will involve playing on a team. How about you? Church, I challenge you today. Are you in the game? Are you in the game? Or you prefer to sit up on the grandstand and watch while others labor, running the field up and down? 
Are, are you in the game? Are, are you ready to criticize when the team fails? And put the blame on someone else. When if you were in the game, we would have won. Are you working together with your church on the field? Or are you sitting aside criticizing? Are you a mere spectator watching others doing the best they can? You may be the eye You'll help to help them run the way without bumping into each other. You may be the hand carrying the ball to the goal, to the touchdown. You may be the feet running as fast as you can. Maybe you're the wide receiver. You're a good catcher and a good runner. Some of us are multi-talented. What can you do to make your church better? I challenge you to ask yourself that question today. What can I do to help my church grow? I'm going to do my part to help make my church grow. I'm not just going to sit down and criticize and expect others to do it all. But I'm going to invest some energy and some time some of my gifts. God wants your time, your talent, and your treasure. In Bible study we learn sacrifices that God appreciates. What's number one, sister? What's the number one sacrifice God appreciates? Ourselves. Our person. What's number two? Our possession. Number three is your praise. And number four is your service. Those are the sacrifices God appreciates. Your person, your possession, your praise, and your service. When we bring all of that together, we are pumped up and we are ready to go. Glory to God. Hallelujah! I'm in it. Count me in. Count me in. Count me in. Glory to God. That's why I run after the collection plate for before it gets the prayer. Because I want my little to be blessed. Hallelujah. <laughs> I don't like when the prayer pray. And I don't have anything in here to be blessed. Amen. Amen. That's why I like to be I don't want to miss the blessing. I don't want to miss it. So today I challenge you. Let's get together. We have one common goal. That is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that he may get all the glory. And all the praise. And you're going to be benefited. Because great is your reward. Great is your reward, which God has stored up for you. God bless you. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. We are better together. Doesn't matter if you're the foot or the hand or the eye. We're the body of Christ. We're on the same team. Praise the Lord. That's why that certain team keeps winning the Super Bowl. <laughs> Praise the oh, Lord. Go. Hallelujah. Oh, no. It's true. 
It's true. Glory to God. <laughs> they didn't have no super saws. <laughs> but Coach Belichick and quarterback Brady. Sorry, Julie. Sorry, Jonathan. But it's the same way in church. When we're on the same page. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Quarterback Brady and his wife, they are a praying team. That's right. They're a praying team. Amen. Hallelujah. When I saw that, I said, oh boy, I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Hallelujah. Those two people are praying people. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. We're on the same team. We're on the same team. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. The invitational hymn, number 589 in your hymns. Amen. <laughs>
to God and bow your heads right where you are. Right where you are. And if, if today this song that tells you here I am Lord. What a prayer. That's what Eli told Samuel to answer God. He says, the next time you hear the call, say, here I am, Lord. Here I am. God is calling you today to unity. Because unity is strength. And when we unite, bringing all our resources together, we can do exploits for the kingdom of God. Are you in? Are you in? If you're in, make that commitment as you're standing right now. Make that commitment. No gift is too small or insignificant. Every gift is important. Every member is important. Every member is important. Make that commitment now as you stand. Eternal God and our Heavenly Father, we come bringing ourselves, our possessions. Yes. We come bringing our praise. Our we, worship. we come bringing our service. Our Lord God, that is true worship today. When we come bringing everything we have before you, leaving nothing out, because that's how you judge our worship. Not by what we bring, but what we have left out. So we're leaving nothing out. We'll come bringing everything. Because we can't lose when we give it to you. Hallelujah. We cannot lose when we give it to you. So we're bringing everything. We don't have less because we give it to you. We have more. Glory. Hallelujah. We have more. So come now, Lord. Bless your people as they stand before you. And as they made that commitment to be counted in on the team, to work together to build your church and to work for the furtherance of your kingdom here on earth, bless them. Bless everything they do. Yes. And grant God that we'll achieve that one goal. Hallelujah. The one goal of the Great Commission. We'll see people saved and baptized. You'll see people excited for the Lord. Hear us now, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Take the name of Jesus with you. Child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort bring you. Take it then wherever you go. Hallelujah. Number 235. If you want to find it in your hands. Yeah.
knowledge now that you are our joy. You are the hope of earth, and your Son is the joy of heaven. God, we praise your holy name that your Son, our Redeemer, came and saved your church. God, now that we go rejoicing with the marching orders to be one in unity in the spirit and the bond of peace, God, that you wrap us up now that we can do all things because we know that you go with us. God, that we can have the power that created the heaven and earth that Jesus brought to earth and now empowers your church. Empower us and move us. Guide us, God, with the power of the Spirit that we would proclaim the gospel and that lives would be saved, that the church would have the impact in the world according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please raise your hands for the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and the Lord give you peace now, henceforth, and forevermore. <laughs>